first of all, uh, let me say that I am very happy to be back uh, at the School of International Relations and Politics, where, as Thomas has already mentioned, I have spent uh, 24 years uh, of my life, a very important part of one's life, actually. And I should thank uh, C.T. Thomas and all the faculty members for giving me this opportunity again. Um, Post-colonialism as, <coughs> as an academic endeavor um, does not have a very long history, even though post-colonial condition as, or a historical condition has a much longer history than post-colonialism as a theory. Um, initially, I should say when I use post-colonial, it does not mean any historical kind of uh, end of colonialism or anything of that sort. And in many cases, as you know, colonialism has not ended uh, in any meaningful sense. Uh, what is important in post-colonial theory is the concern towards a particular kind of decolonization. Decolonization of the mind, as they say. Decolonization of knowledge. Decolonization in the realm of culture, in the realm of values, people's own attachments and ideas. So decolonizing the realm of ideas, knowledge, culture, decolonization of the mind in general is the concern of post-colonial theory. Not particularly about the political and economic processes of decolonization. <laughs> um, there is a difference as you know. And post-colonial theories as they develop, say from the 1990s onwards, uh, in that name, uh, has, as I've mentioned last time also when I talked about this topic here, post-colonial theory of the 90s have two major antecedents. It originates from two major tendencies, both historical and conceptual tendencies earlier. One was the actual intellectual contributions of anti-colonial intellectuals, anti-colonial struggles and movements what was the intellectual contribution of those movements and intellectuals. This is one set of ideas that post-colonial theorists have inherited in a man. Particularly the ideas of Franz Fanon, who was part of the Algerian and African National Liberation Movement, theorized a whole lot on uh, on race, on nation, on gender, and so on and so forth. So that kind of intellectual contributions of people involved in anti-colonial struggles, particularly the, the tradition of Franz Fanon, etc., was one source of inspiration for post-colonial theory to emerge, say, in the 1990s or maybe late 1980s to that. The other source of inspiration for postcolonial theory to emerge was postmodernism, um, which was a major intellectual tendency, say, from the 1970s onwards. Then it was known as poststructuralism, basically, Foucault and others. Um, why was poststructuralism or postmodernism important for? post-colonial thinking. 
the major aspect of interest was the critique of modernity in postmodernism. Critique of modernity in the sense that colonialism itself was <laughs> a modern project. It was emanating from Europe at a time when Europe was undergoing the whole you know, trajectories of enlightenment. Europe was advancing in science, in philosophy, in a number of human sciences and areas. Europe was progressing in political theory, as you know. And philosophers like Immanuel Kant was talking about humanity emerging out of its self-imposed adolescence and becoming uh, mature, uh, becoming somebody who could stand on their own legs, not dependent upon anybody else. Anybody else previously was God, isn't it? That theocentrism of the medieval era was transforming into a kind of anthropocentrism, human-centeredness within modernity. So there was great hope in Europe as expressed by Kant himself who was part and parcel of that European enlightenment. And you had Hegel, Marx, innumerable thinkers and it was the very same Europe in the very same period producing enormous you know, corpus of resources and technologies of colonialism. And so enlightened Europe becoming extremely colonial. And therefore a critique of European modernity was very significant for post-colonial thinkers as well, as it was an important element of postmodern thinking. So postmodernism had something to offer to postcolonialists. So you have certain traditions of anti-colonial struggles and intellectual traditions within the so-called third world. It's mentioned as third world at that time. That was one major source because much of this postcolonial thinking was supposed to be about the so-called third world. And on the other side, the dominant effect of modernity, its colonial project on this supposedly third world entity was also very important. So looking at the whole colonial enterprise from the standpoint of those who are subjected to colonialism is the most important thing. But subjected to colonialism in what sense? Subjected to colonialism in the intellectual sense, in the realm of ideas, in the realm of thinking. That was the major aspect that post-colonial theorists tried to address. Uh, <clears throat> there is a context in which post-colonial theory was emerging. I've mentioned two major sources of it already. The context is the development of new sets of intellectuals per se. Say from the 1980s onwards. We are not talking about a long historical period here. It's very recent times. Uh, this is when all of us were here in this very school. Maybe the buildings are different. That was the time when all these intellectual developments were happening at the global level. So we were all part and parcel of that, either going through with those kinds of theories or critiquing those kinds of theories or whatever it is. So we have grown up with that in a, in a sense. The new sets of intellectuals were emerging mainly because of global changes. New technologies, 
um, much later you could see the virtual world and, and things like that. That's a little bit later, but already signs of that was available in, in the 1980s itself of imaginations about that. You could see Lyotard and others writing the, about the post-modern condition in the 1980s itself, uh, before the internet era and so on. So technology is at one level. At another level, the opportunities to travel, particularly third world intellectuals, to travel to metropolitan capitalist centers across the world. So there is a whole range of migration of in intellectuals happening from Africa, from South Asia, from Australia, and so on and so forth. So you could see that those who have gone through certain colonial experiences, or at least have the, the heritage of colonialism in their own thinking, are now traveling to newer kind of situations, particularly arriving at centers, metropolitan centers, which were important centers of colonial thinking. Um, so you could see that there is a tension developing at the intellectual level. And because of the migration, etc., you know what was happening to Britain, and the United States has always been a nation of migrants um, uh, from Europe and elsewhere. You could see in various parts of continental Europe also migration, uh, you know, instilling some sort of change, not to the extent of what happened in Britain, etc. What was happening was the newly immigrant communities in Britain, particularly from South Asia, from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India, and so on. You could see that the intellectuals among them had to confront situations of hierarchies within the European context. The ways of thinking, questions of race, and newer kinds of arrangements of things, and the implications of a colonial mentality there on the very survival of persons who are newly immigrant people, who are newly immigrant communities per se, within those kinds of contexts. And therefore, the kind of thinking that they have been developing, the intellectual contributions of such people, were addressing not simply the question of the colonizer and the colonized, the first world and the third world and things of that sort. It was also about Europe. It was also about the United States, their own internal hierarchies and problems. And therefore, post-colonial theory was in a way addressing these hierarchies, the, the mentality of people to fix people in certain well-defined social positions. This was also an important context in which post-colonial theory was emerging. So thinking about subalternity, for example, not only within the colonial, not only within the colonized kind of world, but also in the colonial conditions, in the colonizers' own societies. This was also very important. And therefore, as a theory, post-colonial theory was not simply addressing the so-called historically post-colonial societies, not simply about the, the so-called third world, but also the first world, and their own questions of race, migration, um, and innumerable other questions. There. That's why it becomes a theory which has that kind of propensity to travel across national and continental borders. This is very important. And this new set of intellectuals who were traveling from the erstwhile colonies to the metropolitan capitalist centers had an advantage as well. The advantage of having the, the traditions, 
the ways of looking at things from their own respective societies, which they could utilize in critiquing the new societies in which they now function, particularly critiquing the colonizing tendencies within the discourses that were prevalent in metropolitan capitalist centers. So they are bringing a critical aspect into Western kind of intellectual situation. So you could see Edward Said, you could see uh, Ranajit Guha, you could see uh, Homi Ke Baba, you could see Gayatri Chakrabarti Spivak, and a whole lot of people, migrants like this, uh, engaging with the nature of knowledge that's being produced in the United States or Britain or Europe by bringing in a critical perspective from the standpoint of the colonized, from the standpoint of societies from which they come from. So that critical element was very significant for them to achieve something within the metropolitan capitalist centers itself. They were famous not, Edward Said, not in Palestine through his works. He was famous first in the United States. Or Gayatri Spivak was first famous in the United States, not in India. And this is true with Ranajit Guha, this is true with the whole range of people that we are talking about as post-colonial intellectuals. So that critique of colonial mentality and colonial discourses within the new situations in which they work in the Western world is an important element of, and that also adds to the context that I was talking about. Um, there was the other function that these migrating individuals, intellectuals were undertaking, as Gayatri Spivak herself talks about the role of the native informant, as uh, she mentioned about these intellectuals. An informant, you know, is somebody who informs, uh, maybe informs the police, isn't it? <laughs> informs the authorities. <laughs> but informant is also a part of knowledge production, you see. You are well informed and therefore you inform others. It's an academic enterprise as well. So in both sense, in a, in a power hierarchy, uh, they could utilize the, the native knowledge, it's called native informant, and inform the, the metropolitan capital centers, uh, through which they, they, give, they get a lot of advantages both monetary and intellectual <laughs> advantages, like any other informant. So she, you know, talked about herself as a, Gayatri Spivak Chakravarti talked about herself as a native informant in metropolitan capitalist sites. So this was another function that you could see because of this migration of intellectuals. What is extremely important for a variety of disciplines as far as post-colonial theory is concerned is the, the multiplicity of identities that these intellectuals possessed. These are new kinds of intellectuals because they come from particular social backgrounds as have already with political traditions which are very different cultural traditions, linguistic traditions, which are very different from the capitalist centers in which they work. And much of uh, the United States, if, if you take the university system, etc., it's mostly monolingual. These are people who come from uh, with abilities of multiple languages and things of that sort. Uh, very brilliant people with great resources. So you could see a Gayatri Spivak uh, or Gayatri Chakravarti at that time traveling from um, 
India with her uh, Bengali and Sanskrit and English obviously from Calcutta. Then going to the United States, translating Jacques Derrida's book in French to English, writing that long introduction which made her very famous in her 20s. She was like you at that time when she became. Uh, you, you have to salute uh, her courage you know, to, to pick up Derrida who was very famous at that time and translate that from French to English, not to Bengali or Sanskrit or anything of that sort. You could see her speaking German as usual. You don't know how many languages these people converse with and are very, very easy with. And they write like that and they write in Bengali. They write in most of these languages. Uh, so these are intellectuals with that kind of uh, abilities that one is talking about. And therefore, when they write, they get things from all these cultural kind of milieus. And when that is in a way intellectually translated into the English context, it becomes very difficult for the ordinary, even the intellectual reader of the English language. These are tough texts. So if you read Gayatri Spivak's book, The Critique of Postcolonial Reason, for example, you may be looking at something about the third world or something of that sort. It was mostly about Kant, about Marx, and about things of that sort. Uh, what is post-colonial <laughs> in that? Because that the critique of the colonial enterprise from the way it, it emanated in those metropolitan capital centers was the major kind of thrust of that kind of work. And it was written at a time when post-colonial theory was supposed to be about the colonized people, about the so-called third world. That was an attempt at, uh, that was published in the late 1990s. Um, we had a reading group in Lewisburg, 1999. That was when the book was published, Gayatri's a post-colonial reading group actually in the, at Bucknell University. And I could see all this English literature, philosophy, women's studies, professors struggling with this text. Um, for me it was not that difficult, even though it's English is a little bit difficult. The, the logic was not that difficult, because she would use concepts from say Indian classical music, the notion of Samvadi and Vivadi and things of the how uh, Vivadi, the, the dissonant notes produce music, not only the consonant things, and not only that, that which comes in the same realm, same pitch. You could have diversity as an element of creating some kind of meaning. That is possible. That that's simple for us to understand because we have another way of looking at things, and that is possible. And that's precisely what they have contributed to uh, the the Western world in their intellectual milieu, and that's why they became very <coughs> famous in that sense. Uh, she was also, you know, personally told me. I, met her several times actually, uh, that <laughs> let these people read, crack their heads for some time. We have done enough with them. <laughs> this has been our job, you know, for all. Now let them do the other way. Let us make them, let us give them some headache. This was a personal opinion, you know, in personal conversation. So that is also there to make it much more tougher to, to read. Uh, so don't reveal anything so easily. Uh, 
I was just talking about the nature of indi intellectuals who were traveling and the context in which post-colonial theory was evolving. This was also a period with postmodernism already in place. Feminist theories have already been very well established, particularly from the 1950s, 1940s onwards with Simone de Beauvoir's work and in the 1960s, the whole range of movements um, across different parts of the world, you, uh, you could see that there is an alternate notion of power, alternate notions of the linkage between the colonizer and the colonized emerging. And Franz Fanon's work, which I've already mentioned in the 1960s, adding to these kinds of complexities with the question of race and nation being strongly addressed. And this is precisely why these alternate theoretical kind of universe was informing and shaping various kinds of disciplines at one stroke. Traditionally, academic theories are produced within particular disciplines, is it? You have political science theories, you have sociological theories. So when you say a Durkheim or a Weber, it's supposed to be sociologist. So when you say Levi-Strauss, it's an anthropologist. And things of that sort, even though all of them had influence on other disciplines, but they are core to particular disciplines. When we say Machiavelli, it is a political science person. But with post-colonial thinkers, the thing is not like that. You don't know where Edward Said fits in. He was professor of comparative literature at the Columbia University in New York, but has written Orientalism, the question of Palestine and covering Islam. Three of them, those works, Orientalism, question of Palestine and covering Islam was on a particular region, a particular process of how the Western world understood, particularly the Islamic world, particularly West Asia and North Africa, including the question of Palestine. Um, so he was writing that he was a columnist uh, for the nation and the Alahram Weekly and others on music. So he used to write on music uh, very regularly, who himself was a concert level piano player, Edward Said, very friendly with Daniel Barenbaum, who is the famous contemporary Israeli uh, musician, very close friend of Edward Said. And you know when Edward Said died in 2003, September, my memory is correct, um, Said was buried in the Riverside Church in New, New York. He lived most of his life in New York, in Columbia University where he taught. So it was a family affair, the burial, not big crowds or anything of that sort. Uh, but Daniel Barenbaum, the Jewish-Israeli musician, as a close friend was, was there playing Bach and, and Beethoven and other kinds of music for his friend as a last you know, farewell to, to Said, to Edward as they would mention him. So you could see Said as comparative literature professor writing on Islam and West Asia and Palestine and he himself is a Palestinian who was a member of the Palestinian National Council, had differences with Yasser Arafat and resigned from the PNC and so on, opposed the Oslo peace process, the agreement in 1993 and so on. And Said has written so many things as you know, culture and imperialism, Beginnings, Intention and Method, his initial work on Joseph Conrad, and you could see an innumerable 
collections of essays on various aspects of politics. He has even written on, on the fate of the Congress party in, in India, um, and so on and so forth. So what are these intellectuals? Which discipline do they belong? Actually, they do not belong to any discipline as such, because these kinds of newer theories in themselves, post-colonial theory including, had that propensity to influence a variety of disciplines, that interdisciplinarity, or in a, in a sense that non-disciplinarity is part and parcel of the newer kinds of theories. Due to a variety of reasons that I've already mentioned, the context in which the, such theories have been evolving, the migration of intellectuals, the migration also is not only about migrating across nation state borders and continents, migration is also about use of languages, it's also about migrating across the borders of disciplines. And conventional disciplines of knowledge, you know, had that nation state framework within it. Um, it's so tightly bound, you know, every discipline has, has had its own particular kind of discourses. You can't break that. Even now the political science IR kind of thing you all know. Uh, such things occur. People with some kind of intellectual sensibility, these are uh, absurd ideas, isn't it? What? So you could see that those kinds of traditional modern Westphalian nation state global arrangement was the model in which modern disciplines have also have been founded in the 19th century and late. So a major break was coming. It came in the early 20th century when you had the Frankfurt School, you had Gramsci and others who influenced a variety of disciplines. Gramsci, for example, education, sociology, political science, uh, culture and, and things of that sort. But as a big movement, when feminist theories, when postmodernism and postcolonial theory emerged, it became much more pervasive, where disciplinary borders could not be maintained as it was maintained earlier. So if you speak the language of discursivity or discourse, it's not simply about cultural theory, it's not simply about literature or, or you know, a study of linguistics or anything of that sort. It's about politics, it's about a variety of other things. So this is the broad context in which post-colonial theory was emerging. What is the crux of post-colonial theory actually? What are they doing? They are searching for colonial tendencies within the existing realm of knowledge. I've told you the whole project is decolonizing knowledge, decolonizing the intellectual sphere. Why is that decolonization needed? Because even if you achieve political and economic decolonization, one could still see colonialism not going away from the, the process of thinking, from the realm of knowledge. And therefore, decolonization of knowledge is required. And in order to decolonize, one has to find out how colonialism works in the field of knowledge. So the initial search is for the colonial discourses present in contemporary epistemological sphere, in the contemporary knowledge realm. What are the ways in which colonialism functions within the intellectual arena? So the postcolonial theorists would use the term colonial discourse to note that. So postcolonialism as a theory is about finding out colonial discourses and critiquing it. So a critique of colonial discourse is what a postcolonial theorist is 
actually doing. Said's book, Orientalism, was a classic text in this uh, kind of an endeavor, where in Orientalism he has, uh, you know, mapped the ways in which Western perceptions about the Orient, about the East, was developing over a period of time in a colonial manner. It was a whole range of discursive field which is informed by colonialism that you could find the Occident, the West and the Orient are described. Mostly it's about the Orient, isn't it? How the Western world looked at the East. But by producing that kind of a knowledge realm, what the West was doing is to self-define Europe, define themselves. So if you can find out enough of these uncivilized people out there uh, who has to be civilized, etc., then the assumption would be that those who are talking about this are civilized. So the West immediately becomes civilized once they talk about others as uncivilized. This is the easiest way to become civilized. You talk about others and we always do that. Rekha uh, Isio was written on those kinds of discourses in our midst, how we do that. So Europe was suddenly becoming a very civilized place. In spite of what I was telling you, yes, it had its own enlightenment and everything. But its colonial enterprise is suddenly becoming, you know, it can be whitewashed with this newly acquired intellectual kind of position as somebody who has a determining effect, a subject position with regard to others who, who are given a kind of object position. Otherness is attributed to the East. So attributing otherness is a way of self-definition. So it's not simply about others, it's mostly not about others. The whole academic enterprise in Europe about Orientalism, you still have in the London University that famous school, isn't the School of Oriental and African Studies. In Germany you had from the days of Max Müller onwards, everywhere you had Russia you had the Oriental Studies. In some places it survives, in some places the names have been altered. But what is this Orient? If you ask anybody, do we live in, in an Orient or something like that? We don't feel like that, isn't it? We don't know such, such a place called Orient. It doesn't exist actually. But it's about Therefore, whether it exists or not, there is the discourse about it. The othering of people who are supposed to be living there. And what Said was talking about, and this was termed by Said as imaginative geography. So you produce these kinds of terrains through your imagination, so that it looks like a very normal place out there, you know, it is talking about all of us. And things of that sort. What is colonial about this kind of an enterprise is not simply because these kinds of knowledges from Europe was emanating during a colonial period, the political economy of colonialism. That is not what makes it colonial. It, is, it assists that process. It aggravates that process. What Said and many others would say, and it's also from Foucault in that sense, that it is the field of knowledge which is produced along these lines that informs colonialism itself. It makes colonialism possible as an enterprise. So even if you are very knowledgeable, you know, we have heard uh, such things, 
For example, Gyani Sail Singh, who could not speak English very much, he was our president and nobody remembers him. Now, Gyani is Gnani, you know who is. And he is supposed to be very foolish because he doesn't speak any English. Uh, so everybody who is <laughs> not uh, in the way in which civilized people are understood in the colonial context, in, in the European ways of thinking, suddenly becomes a fool who has to be now educated, who has to be civilized and so on. So that civilizing mission is not only a political economy mission of colonialism, a cultural mission of colonialism, it is also a mission which involves a particular way of positioning both the West and the East. So the West and the East, even though both are really or imaginatively are inhabited by people, suddenly you will have an, a kind of antithetical imagination, an antithetical evaluation of both the West and the East. They are not the same. They are entirely different. So that difference is produced out of the whole, uh, you know, colonial discursive operations. Actually, the West and the East are products of the colonial discourse of Orientalism, actually. So it's not prior to that. A West and a, an East of this kind will not be there without an Orientalist colonial discourse. It produces those things. So Edward Said would be talking about several kinds of Orientalisms. That was his Orientalism as a colonial discourse. And I've told you colonial discourse is at the core of post-colonial theory. Orientalism as a colonial discourse, not simply as its institutional forms, etc., as academic disciplines, university departments and other things in the Western world. On the other side, it is this ontological imagination. Ontological simply means that the idea there exists an East and a West. There exists an East and therefore a West. That is the, the ontological imagination within Orientalism as colonial discourse. For Said, it's also an epistemological thing and that is at the core. It's about knowledge, as I've told you. It's epistemological in the sense that you are creating knowledge about the Orient. Who are creating? Not the Orient is talked about by not by the people of the so-called Orient. I've told you whether there's an Orient or not. But the Orient is talked about people from the West. So it's a Western way of producing knowledge about the East. Not every kind of knowledge about the East. And that kind of knowledge, what is the characteristic features of this knowledge? In order to analyze that, that characteristics of that knowledge, which is colonial knowledge as far as Said is concerned, it is analyzed through the ideas developed by Michel Foucault, as you know, particularly Foucault's conception of the linkage between knowledge and power. And that's why I've told you the postmodern tendencies have an influence on postcolonial thinking, as you could see. Both the way in which the idea of discourse is used in the colonial discourse, and also this linkage between knowledge and power. This is very important. So if you want to decolonize the intellectual sphere, the sphere of knowledge, the way colonial knowledge is constructed has to be understood. How is it constructed? It is constructed, as Foucault would say, that without the imagination of a field of power, knowledge itself is not possible. And vice versa also is true that without uh, you know, a, the you know, a field of knowledge working. You cannot produce the effect of power. 
you can do something only when there is a field of knowledge that informs that action otherwise power will not function per se so both ways a field of power is required to produce knowledge a, a field of knowledge is required to effect power that kind of linkage is very important to understand orientalism as a colonial discourse because of the subject position that is ascribed to the west and the object position the position of the other ascribed to the so called east and what happens is that because of this subject object dichotomy that is already built into this discourse what happens is that you have no escape from this position of the object position of the other so the oriental is always the other it's a kind of perpetual other with no possibility of breaking this discourse and claiming subjectivity that is why you require critique of colonial discourses of this kind of orientalism in this idean case how will you do that you produce counter hegemonic kind of discourses counter colonial discourses through alternate kind of theorizing by not simply positioning the east as subject and the west as object because that most often can repeat the way the west has looked at the east but you cannot totally deny that possibility also by making the east as the subject is very important what gayatri spivak would call a kind of strategic ontology uh because you you cannot say that i am not an easterner per se or for that matter as a westerner even though you know that it doesn't fit well if you totally deny any of those kinds of possibilities then what kind of standpoint that one can develop so if you identify as a colonized for example then there is a possibility of thinking about colonialism from a different perspective very different from the colonizers perspective on colonialism itself and therefore that kind of ontological position that i exist like this is also required even though a criticism of that is also required because you don't know whether it's already constituted by the existing colonial discourse or is it really an alternate position that you take that's a very difficult process so you have to start somewhere by imagining that you are not the other of the already existing discourses that are produced you have to claim your subjectivity your subjecthood you are not simply the object or the other and this kind of claiming subjectivity this attempt at self determination is what a decolonization process is all about and we are very familiar with the anti colonial discourses about this in the movements etc in historical so you you would see terms like self rule self determination self assertion and, and so in a critique of post colonial discourse what post colonial thinkers are also doing is this self determination job you are not the other of somebody else's self but you are the self of yourself so that we claiming the self that kind of or claiming the self that kind of asserting the self that kind of determining the self self determination in that sense is a very important part of intellectual decolonization so we would look at the whole realm of knowledge that's produced about us from our own standpoint our own positions and that is the kind of strategic ontological position that one could 
imagine, as Gayatri would talk about. So, the point is that there is this self other dichotomy that a colonial discourse like Orientalism produces, where we are othered and selfhood is ascribed to somebody else. And even if there is no historical colonialism, etc., just imagine this very process of the self as some set of people and the other as some other set of people and the whole discourse that the self produces about the other is in itself a colonial discourse. If that discourse does not consider the selfhood of the other. You cannot produce knowledge without a subject and the object etc. That is required for any production of knowledge. But it will not become colonial per se if the selfhood of the other. Because we are talking about human societies. It's human or social sciences that we are talking about where people are our objects, isn't it? Objects of study, objects of theorizing, producing knowledge. And people are with subjectivities. So our object is a pool of subjectivities. And if we recognize them not simply as an object of your own knowledge making, but as subjects in themselves, then the way you conduct yourself in the field of knowledge, the way you produce knowledge about others would be qualitatively very different. That would recognize the subjectivity of the other. That's the way in which, where you will have intersubjective dialogue, various other ways, not simply about the self and the other as two extremely distinct entities. So, the knowledge power equation functions in such a manner that the very idea of a self and the other, ontologically determined like that, produces a discourse, produces a kind of knowledge which in itself is colonial in character. And that discourse, therefore, has to be questioned by reclaiming subjectivities for the otherness that is attributed to sets of peoples or communities within this particular colonial discourse. So that's why you would see during this post-colonial kind of writings, writing back, or you could see uh, you know, this decolonization of the mind, decolonization of knowledge, everything of that sort is this kind of a response, self-determination, asserting oneself, not, we are not the other of somebody else's discourse. We can produce our own discourse. That's the kind of decolonization that's talked about. You could see that the effect of all these things were a whole range of discussion on identities. I've already talked about the context in which migration, etc., was taking place in a big manner. And there are layers of identities now infusing together in one's own identity. So, and that has a lot to do with, uh, you know, modern capitalist development. Uh, innumerable ways in which people identify themselves. Even though we know in our own particular societies certain identities like caste, religion and things of that sort are so well entrenched that very many layers of identity is not available to us as in many other parts of the world. But if you compare with historical situations there are innumerable newer identities that one could imagine for oneself. And this is particularly true about, uh, you know, the process of migration and the new communities that are being formed. So you could see now a, a, an Assami Malayali now, or a Bengali, a Bihari Malayali now, a Bihari who speaks Malayalam and things of that sort. Earlier we had uh, mostly Keralites speaking Malayalam. 
people in mahi also their mother tongue is also malayalam so kerala it's an uh, old pondicherry state spoke malayalam uh, but now you could see north indian people speaking malayalam due to migration to kerala and things of that sort so levels of identities grow because of that and much of the intellectual work of uh, the post colonialist therefore was on this kind of hybridity that was coming up in the identity of people and how to address that those kinds of layered identities as layers as concentric circles with some core identity in the middle <laughs> or there are innumerable questions the western world try to tackle these kinds of things by very flawed notions of multiculturalism and things of that sort um multiculturalism simply means that uh, it's about speaking about non whites in europe and the united states so it's another word for racism and i had such encounters i don't know whether the city was in bangalore when we had the um american studies conference an american white american professor she was speaking about multiculturalism in the united states and it was all about the latinos the asians the africans little bit about the black people in the united states and so, so after all thing i actually asked her a question <laughs> i was so furious about it are there no whites in the united states they are more than 80% of the us population you should remember <laughs> but they are not there in their notions of multiculturalism what the post colonial writers were talking about was the precarious situation in which now they are placed i have told you about guy trispivak or or edward said anybody for that matter the layers of identity in in them i always talk about this on sai this and it sai as a, a comparative literature professor a palestine in a right from islam on music um and i would say he is such a well dressed uh, gentleman three piece suit he goes to class with tie and um but for many others you know he is a palestinian revolutionary something of that sort and so he is called sometimes even by the new yorker uh, as a as a terrorist so a piano playing three piece suit wearing university professor world renowned intellectual as a terrorist he doesn't have a gun or anything of that sort it's not needed because you are a palestinian and so how many identities in one one self is palestinian he is christian he is and i have told you his friends are israelis jews for many how can that happen what and, and so on. so complexity because of a variety of identities infused in one's own identity and mostly what intellectuals do or usual persons do in everyday life is to strategically use one identity over the other privilege a particular identity according to situation uh, isn't it so now if you go to gujarat you won't say i am a muslim obviously because that would be Uh, disadvantages to say the least or at least you can save your life <laughs> by asserting that i am a professor or a student or something of that that identity may work sometimes you can't keep those identities uh, separately because the names would say the the actions would say and so on and so forth but what is important is the point is that Uh, now human societies particularly due to these kinds of migration not every part of the world but this kind of migration from 
the so-called third world two metropolitan centers have produced complexities of identities. And because of the hierarchies of identities that already exist in those societies and these people add to those hierarchies, questioning them also would become a part and parcel of challenging the colonial discourse that, that already exists in those kinds of societies. So a whole range of work by post-colonialists would be coming through those kinds of notions. You had in history the subaltern studies and other sets of groups, a whole range of people working on a variety of things, even though it's called subaltern studies group and, and so on. So in history you had subaltern studies. The whole uh, literary criticism you had post-colonial theories influence on understanding discourses of various kinds. Cultural theory as a discipline itself is greatly informed by post-colonialism as a theory. And then political science and international relations in sociology, everywhere we utilize these kinds of things in order to understand the ways in which colonial discourses are produced, our intellectual field could be decolonized by questioning those colonial discourses. I'll stop there and have some questions so that we can develop some of these ideas.